Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I uh, lived in Ohio at the time, and, and of course I was 10 years old when we landed on the moon, but um, I'm one of five kids in our household, and uh, I started carving my mother's broomsticks. She got consternated with me, and she said, why are you doing this? I said, well, the trees outside are wet. They don't carve as sharp as uh, the hardwood that you have on your broom and mop handles. So she would give me a, a meat saw to cut her handles off, and I would learn how to carve with those. And so I always worked with my hands. And so uh, when I got in, of course, in high school, I really looked at the engineering world, and uh, that was really suited for me. And then, of course, the opportunity of course, I couldn't have predicted the shuttle program coming along, but when I, of course, came out, uh, the shuttle program was just getting started. So I started in 1978, just coming out of school. So it was an opportunity uh, to use my skills and to use my hands. Well, you know, I tell you what, I, uh, I was kind of an unusual person. I was really, where the guys were doing a lot of sports and stuff, I was actually doing art. I was doing things. I actually got caught in a typing class when I was a freshman in high school. The only class that was available was typing, and I was the only boy in, in the typing thinking, I'll never be a secretary, but I'll learn how to go home row and learn. Well, the advent of the computers came on, and that made me apropos. I'd know my home rows and everything. So really, it was serendipitous. It was actually very serendipitous that I took some of the classes. I took industrial arts. In other words, making things. I'd bring them home, show my family, and show everybody. Uh, but I really loved my hands, working with my hands. And, uh, but uh, I'm just a hands-on kind of person. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, uh, of course, you know, I came in, uh, Martin Marietta, hired in uh, in 1978, October 78. We were on what we call the external tank or the ET. It, of course, is the backbone to the shuttle. And uh, so we were uh, involved here at the Marshall Space Flight Center to do uh, stress analysis. In other words, will the tank withhold the, the uh, stresses of launching with 1.6 million pounds of fuel inside with an orbiter, a 100 ton orbiter hanging, our 90 ton orbiter hanging off with its payload. So we were in a stress analysis program from 78, 79, and 80. And then of course we flew in 81. So um, we were involved inside the tank. We were a test team that actually inputted what we call the internal access kit. In other words, we can gain access inside the tank, every square inch of it, and do our instrumentation so we can actually find out the stresses. And it did pass in 1979 and 80, and that was ready to be for flight. We were a, an exclusive team to actually access the tank flight worthy and the flight configuration. In other words, it was in a vertical position. So we actually had to go roughly 90 feet up in the hydrogen tank and then there's an inner tank and then there was another uh, you know, 50 more feet to go in the LOX tank. So there was a, t a, a, a tank that had really two tanks in it. And if you count the inner tank, it's three tanks. So uh, we had to verify, of course, the stress of the tank and then, of course, the uh, foam insulation that went on outside, too, to make sure that it would stick properly, that it would do its job of not forming ice as it ascends to hit the orbiter like we saw in Columbia. You know, we had that issue there. But uh, uh, it was a, a really a, a writing procedures. And I uh, wrote a book called Remove Before Flight, and I described the fact that, I'll tell you one element, is we had in the forward nose of the external tank, the LOX tank, the oxidizer, we had to verify design, we filled it with mud and got 1 .6, about 1.5 million pounds of, of uh, pressure in the tank, and I was selected to be the one to clean it out. They drained the mud and I rode an apparati down the center of the tank with a spray hose and my hood came off. The airline fell off. So I was down in the tank 50 feet and I was almost suffocated. Oh my gosh. So they brought me up on a boat winch. Wow. So we were writing the procedures. So we didn't, uh, we got quality course involved. They came and wrote it in and said, hey, knucklehead, tie that down, do this, do all the changes. So we actually were a test team that did what we call night shift work, which was writing the procedures for the next technicians during the day when 
mass equality was around. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the, here again, the development of the external tank was uh, uh, over a several year period of time where we had what we call the standard weight tank. Now the standard weight tank was uh, the initial tanks to fly the test program of the shuttle. It was about 76,000 pounds dry weight. In other words, it was 2219 aluminum and uh, it was 76,000 pounds. Well, NASA came along and decided to shave 10,000 additional pounds off of that tank. For every pound you save on Earth, it's a pound you can carry in orbit. So we didn't paint the external tank. If you remember, the first tanks were white. We left the paint off and that was 600 pounds of paint. And it did not affect, so the rest of the tanks were orange from that flight on. Then we actually brought the tank down to 66,000 pounds. And then when the International Space Station came on board, we were to go to the inclination for the Russians, which is a lot further up from our polar regions, and they wanted us to shave off eight additional uh, pounds off of that, 8,000 pounds. So we brought the tank down to 58,000 pounds from 76 to 66 to 58. So that was the development called the super lightweight tank, which is the last vehicle flew with a friction stir, super lightweight, $63 million tank. So still quite big, still quite heavy, and still quite expensive. Well, it carried 1.6 million pounds of fuel and emptied out in eight minutes, in eight minutes. And so it had the life of McDonald's fries, basically. But it did so much. Without the external tank, it would not have gone in dormant. People like John Glenn, Eileen Collins, all those folks would not have had their ride. So we provided a ride for them with that external tank. It was very sophisticated. The Apollo era was brand new. Most of those parts were brand new and it only came back the capsule. So we expended the whole vehicle, 363 feet. Really, basically the whole vehicle didn't come back except for maybe you know 15 feet of it, which was the uh, command you know, pilot where the astronauts were at the tip. Of course, I was 10 when that happened, but of course technology being what is with the shuttle was deemed to be reusable. In my time, it was, re it was called a space truck. In other words, basically, we we're going from exploration into a face, uh, space truck type of a scenario where common people uh, uh, could go up and put up satellites, repair satellites, and uh, do the uh, you know weather satellites, things of that nature, TDRA satellites, uh, telescopes, Hubble telescope, the Chandra telescope, things like that that we were able to loft in you know average shirt sleeve type environment. But it was really kind of scary initially after STS-1. We really uh, didn't know if Columbia could fly again on STS-2. So really, one was really exciting, but two was really fraught with the fear of, hey, maybe we, this wasn't reusable like we thought. But then, of course, we had 135 missions. We failed twice, which gives us a good, scenario, you know, a good percentage. Uh, given the fact that the complexity of the shuttle was tremendous and it was it never got any easier It was hard every time yes. Every time so I would reiterate the fact that the STS 2 was more fraught with unknowns than STS 1 You realize oh we did it. We have to do it again. That's right. That's right And, and of course one was a, a pathfinder for us So we corrected the things that did go wrong nominally on STS 2 which helped paved its way like like you know, Apollo 10 did for Apollo 11. It just kind of did a, you know, a run before they actually landed on the moon. Apollo 10 did everything that 11 would have done except land on the moon. So without that information of the correction, 11 would not have made it either. Okay, well the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder itself. Right now was built during the early, of course, days of the space shuttle program because we didn't want to use a billion dollar orbiter to cut away metal when we put it in the test stand at Marshall. We actually put in the Enterprise, which is an orbiter that's in New York, you know, on display now. So when, the, when that came to us around 1976, 77 timeframe, we built this model basically 
to use uh, so we didn't have to use the real bird. So if there was any damage, it would only be on that makeup. So anyhow, the, the, uh, they had the World's Fair for Japan's World's Fair was during later in the 80s and they, we loaned it to them and they turned it into the shuttle. Got it. They shipped it back and we had it in a hangar going, what the heck are we gonna do with this? But the reality of it is we put this program together for an iconic view for the next generations to put it on top. So it is really, uh, it was integral for us for our testing, but it serves as an inspirational uh, tool and looks, and it, I'm, you know, it, it's almost a scale. It's about 10 foot shorter than the actual bird that we flew, but it's pretty darn close. So uh, I was honored to be associated with that. It's amazing. And that weighs 89 tons today, and there's 69 tons of those bearing down on that aft portion of the external tank, so we had to beef that up. So there's 89 tons bearing down on that tank. It's not light. It's not light. The uh, iconic view of that Pathfinder is international, and of course today with the advent of the internet, you know, with Facebook and everything, you see it all the time. Mm -hmm. So Huntsville is uh, recognized by that iconic view. And so I hope it stays as long, and, and of course the renovation that we're going through is going to be very important to carry it beyond certainly my lifetime, but really for the next hundred years, you know, really to inspire the next generation engineer. And uh, here again, that's why we did it and it was a good utilization of spare parts we had left over. Well, you know, it was interesting that I'm here because I was a young guy back in 1988 when that was put in. Of course, you know, the Challenger accident happened in 1986. So engineers were standing around really with their thumbs, kind of rolling their thumbs a little bit. And uh, my director at the time, Tony Andrioni, and I'll mention his name because he was very instrumental in, in, in uh, getting it started. Uh, Alex uh, uh, of the Shuttle Projects um, was part of funding it and everything, but they agreed to let us use the very first test tank called MPTA, Main Propulsion Test Article, that was a run tank to certify the cluster firings of the SSMEs or Space Shuttle Main Engine in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. So during Mardi Gras, a test team went down there and pulled it out of its test stand after 10 years of testing to bring it here to Huntsville. And of course, I brought it off the barge. I was involved in the logistics end of it. So I, I actually pulled it off the barge and brought it here. Uh, and of course, we ran into different problems. And I told you about that a little bit. I won't get into that. You can show us the, the book. Well, I'll tell you, well, here, I'll just tell you a funny caveat just to tell you how, how, how it was. But we have a book, of course, you know, my book here describes the whole situation back in 19, September of 88. Uh, we actually got the tank. But um, being the logistics guy, I had to plan, you know, for all the uh, transportation from Marshall to here for the display. And I mapped out the area. And it was a little over, you know, four and a half, three, almost five miles where gravel would go for our transporter not to tip over. So we had to put gravel here, gravel there, all the way, those five miles. Well, we got to the center and we had to make a 90 degree turn. And when we made that turn, there was a tree in the way. I didn't calculate a tree. So we got with the center director here at the Space and Rocket Center during the time, it was called Space and Rocket, and Ed Buckby, bless Ed's uh, common sense, said get a chainsaw, cut the tree down. So basically, I uh, tell that story in the book, and this is the only picture in existence because I had a camera. That's amazing. So right there. So we had to sacrifice the tree to get the 76,000-pound uh, uh, tank in its place. The, uh, the building of the International Space Station. Uh, it's in service today, and without the shuttle, the International Space Station that's being serviced today with some alumni that's really from here. Mm -hmm. So our legacy really of the space shuttle program is building the International Space Station. That was a very exciting time. Uh, and I take pride in that, knowing that the Hubble telescope was lofted during the time of the shuttle and serviced five times. So the 
uh, Hubble will last about 2025, give us a window to the heavens until about 2025 because of the shuttle. So we know how insignificant we are by the Hubble telescope. So that's a marvel. Think of this, Diana, 5,000 years of man's recorded history, right? What did we do for 4,950 of those years? So I see, a, as a docent here, I see a 10-year-old with a cell phone in his or her pocket that has more power than it took to get to the moon. We have transcended the last 50 years. We live in a marvelous time, and I'm excited for your generation. Your generation is the Mars generation, and I'm excited to be part of that in the way of leaving that legacy, leaving that... Uh, intangible, really uh, inspiration to want to lead this planet. And I think it's going to be necessary in the future. It's not if, it's when we need to lead this planet. And I think we have a start. 4,950 years, we kind of sat around. But the last 50 years, we've actually left this planet. So we live in marvelous times. And like I say, uh, uh, just a, as a thank for my uh, thing I did at Marshall uh, during the return to flight is the fact that I built a time capsule to be opened uh, when we land man on Mars. That's and awesome. I may not be here, I'm an old guy now, but the fact is my boys will be, and it will connect them back to me. So there is a time capsule at Marshall that is gonna be opened at the time of we landing man on Mars, and we'll, or woman, either way. So uh, I've left even a legacy even then, 20 years ago, for what's gonna happen in the future. I uh, not only did go through the Challenger disaster in 86, and uh, I, of course I lived through that. That really, in a way, we knew we were coming back with Challenger. We knew we had a mission. We were going to find the problem and fly again. Columbia was a different story. We knew that was the death nail. So really, uh, at that point in time, it was 29 months that we were shut down with Columbia. And during that time, of course, our product was indicted. In other words, foam did come off the tank. So we had a very a lot of overtime during that time. Uh, my wife didn't see me that much uh, during that 29 months. Um, what made it extra hard was we knew we weren't coming back. The president of the United States did an executive order to end the shuttle program in 2010, making way for another program to go back to the moon, which got canceled by the next administration. So the space program took a hit. That's when my uh, brother was dying of lung cancer. So I went ahead and retired, uh, knowing that uh, you know possibly for 10 years we'd be uh, deciding what we wanted to do. And I, and I chose right, I think, really to be here at the space and rock, US Space and Rocket to inspire the next generation that's going to take us to the Mars. But yes, I was involved during the, the, the Columbia, and that was a very, very hard time. A lot of people were laid off during that time. Uh, the tankage went down. We didn't build as many tanks, obviously, because we knew the finite element that we were flying out 13 more missions. So we knew we only had about 13 more tanks. So a lot of people left. And, uh, but I stuck with my passion of making the models, and I was able to make them for people that worked on that. And it helped buoy, here again, Eileen Collins flew the first re return to flight mission. Uh, so I was involved in that and to give her a shuttle model, you know, for her to sign and the time capsule that we did really buoyed me. So my artwork really buoyed me, individually so. It kept me at at attached to it in a positive way. But there was a lot of negative during the Columbia. Well, you know, the thing is, is towards the end of the shuttle program, we had developed a weld process called friction stir welding. In other words, we uh, uh, modernized the welding process to bring these gore panels together to create these large tanks, like the SLS is a large external tank, basically. In fact, it's almost the same color as a, as a uh, space shuttle external tank. So there's a lot of what we call heritage parts being used on SLS, okay? The friction stir in particular was developed during the shuttle program that has really paved the way for these large tanks to be created or made for SLS. So in a way, we went over that, you know, 20 years ago to make 
today a reality for SLS. So it's really a reiterate, you know, here again, the shuttle program is one level. Now we've upped it to the next level. So we've learned from one to get to SLS. So it took the shuttle to get to SLS, okay? And there's fingerprints of all over that thing. And I could almost go back in there and, uh, you know, a lot of things would be very similar. Yeah, but I'm older now. I'm not the young buck I used to be climbing around during that time. But uh, that was my time. This is your generation's time. And I want to pass that on to you. Well, you know, telling you the earlier story, uh, I started out that I did carve my mom's broomsticks. And of course, I learned about the study of dendrology. And the study of dendrology is the study of wood. And there's over 20,000 different species of woods available in the world. So uh, when I got in the shuttle program, of course, I was just a, a, you know, a minor element in the program, but I found my passion by creating these bottles for returning shuttle crews. And so when the shuttle crews, of course, got on to see them after their post-flight, they would come to Marshall and tell us about our product and everything. Well, I'd have one of, sh of my shuttle models for them to sign. So, of course, I got to be known as Shuttle Man because I did this uh, for 30 years, and so I did 450 of these. But uh, it was described to me by Eileen Collins, the first uh, female uh, commander of a shuttle, and she said, you know, Scott, we see uh, uh, water in landmass. We don't see the borders like you do. You get woods from South America, Africa, you know, Germany, you know, uh, upper, you know, every place in Israel, everywhere, and you fashion it into a one orbit for us through your shuttle models. And so she gave me kind of a, a really NASA's uh, a wood car in the sense that I give them one orbit through all the woods that's, you know, international in scope. So the natural beauty is not, a, I don't paint or stain any of this, it's all of its natural state of wood, so you can see how diverse, so diversity is really a plus. So I found that in my shuttles, and uh, of course I continue to make them today for retiring astronauts. I just love working with my hands, and I always have, I have a workshop at home, and, and uh, so I create these uh, for other people as they retire. And how long does something like this take? 75 you? hours. Wow. Uh, the, the external tank itself is 100 years old, and cherry. So I use repurposed wood, that's well seasoned. So you don't want to crack in your model, you know, 10 years from now. You want wood that's well seasoned. So I get woods that are 50 to 100 years old. And then I apply my skill for 75 hours. I'm a lathe turner and a carver. And then I actually create one of these out of thin air. Basically, it just, I put everything together and then, it, then 75 hours later, it's out of thin air like a song. So. Here again, I continue to make them, and uh, like I say, I donate you know, to the center once in a while to raise money and things of that nature. But uh, um, like I say, it's a joy really in my older retirement to be able to do these because that gives me something, uh, uh, really a purpose. I'm still connected to the shuttle program. Even though it's retired, I'm still connected. So I have an advantage there of, of my artwork connecting me forever. The shuttle was for 30 years, my artwork is forever. It's a great feeling, isn't it? It's a wonderful feeling. And I hope someday everyone develops their passion and leave a wonderful legacy. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about the medallion? Well, yeah, this medallion here, of course, we had an end of the shuttle program competition for the flight patch. And uh, a gentleman won because uh, this was selected. So this is actually the flight patch that was picked for the ending of the shuttle program. So even though I engrave each one since the program is over, I put the medallions on to show people, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years from now that this was associated with the whole shuttle program. So that symbol represents all 135 missions, including Columbia and Challenger. So I use that and you can buy those, you know, you can buy those and get those as collector's items now, but uh, you can get those readily available. And I bought a bunch so I can put those on my models. But it's a nice accent to it. It's amazing. It's yeah, it really brings that out. So it really tells the story. It's a really, uh, anyone that looks at, had anything to do with the shuttle program, looks at my artwork, 
they're reminded by the grand time that we had during that era. It's a wonderful reminder. And like you said, the blending of the woods coming together, the diversity in the woods, it just comes right. together so beautifully. Right. Like Eileen was saying, she said, Scott, you know, you are an artist in the light that uh, you get woods from all around the different continents that we fly over. So really, you're one orbit to us. Thank you for doing that. And I was really blown away for her to say that. But uh, I'm still a wood carver at heart. <laughs> well, that's, that's fantastic that you're able to combine your two passions. Well, here again, we want to cut really through the spectrum of people. Not everybody's an engineer. Not everybody uh, likes to work with their hands. You know, you have musicians, you know, you have, uh, you know, doctors and lawyers and things of that nature. We need to be inspired, okay? Inspiration. Now, interestingly, I was alive during the moon landing. I was 10 years old. And I remember on Apollo 11, there was a billion people around the Earth more paying attention to what we had accomplished. But then I also remembered Apollo 12, and then of course 13 and 14, 15. They didn't get the audience that the first got. Fast forward 50 years for half of the people that are not alive, the same thing happened. We went to celebrate the Apollo 11, a half a million people came. We went to celebrate 12 and 13, a fraction came. So that tells me People need to be inspired every day. Landing man on the moon was great, but it lost its luster after the second or third flight 50 years ago. In a way, inspired a lot of people, don't get me wrong. But in modern times today, even the people that weren't alive weren't inspired after Apollo 11. It became ho-hum. So it tells me you need to come up with something new every day. You need to stay sharp and be on the cutting edge you know, on your art or whatever to inspire that person. So the guitar for the 50th anniversary not was made out of the moon wood, you know, that we, we got. The guitar, how are you going to tell this Apollo story except through music that lasts forever? Governments change, space programs change, presidents change, but what stays constant for the next 10,000 years? Music. In 10,000 to 5,000 years from now, Neil Armstrong will always be the first one, but the Saturn V, if we attach it to the music, will always be the vehicle that took us to the moon. Well, you know, the thing is, I, uh, when I did retire, you know, later I, uh, I had a lot of things. But a lot of things were tangible, but things I had were stories, like I was just showing in my book, that uh, I needed to tell the next generation, otherwise they wouldn't know. So really, through my book, Removed Before Flight, I tell the journey of a person that just had an opportunity to be able to use his passion. I just had an opportunity. Everyone else would have done the same thing, using their integrity, their honesty, or whatever you brought to it, would have done the same thing. I was unique because I actually did the shuttle models and I had opportunity to be on the shuttle program. So, uh, but for the next generation, my book is really a story. I didn't put any stories in the book that didn't give a teaching moment, okay? And it, when you read my book, you'll see my life initially be very similar to yours uh, in the humble beginnings, elements, and the opportunities, but in developing your passion. But the real story is I want to tell, and I do tell the story through the, uh, uh, going into schools, talking to fifth graders, through the Microwave Dave uh, uh, Music Foundation, that we tell them to attach themselves to something larger than themselves, okay? In other words, if you're uh, a young person and uh, uh, you're serving yourself, you will become bored very quickly. But when you're serving other people or other things, it becomes exciting and it's perpetual, it's forever, as long as it goes on. So I tell, I, I inspire the next generation to attach themselves to that. Go through the tough times. We're all going through tough times. We have a, a spouse that dies or a, a loss of a job or, or you know, a rever job reversal, things of that nature. 
But if you go through the tough times like we did during the Challenger, in the Challenger accident, uh, we were shut down for 32 months. We bucked up and said, hey, we let the American people down, let's get back to work. <laughs> and so uh, really another thing I'd say too that is most important, and I have to reiterate this, is finding and valuing unconditional love is really our purpose. If you're in the engineering or you're in the arts or whatever, if you don't have it to share with people and you're doing it by yourself, that's good and fine. But I found later in life that it was actually an insulation, really a burnout, that I actually had a partner in life that actually supported my hobby of carving the models and of course my obviously working in the shuttle program. So I really give really a kudos to my wife, Diane Phillips, Diana, but uh, the fact that she supports me 100%. Of course, I have two boys, Christian and Tyler. And uh, so uh, uh, I tell them all the time, they see that through my actions. They see the models that I do for astronauts, things of that nature, and it's a legacy that I can leave them because they're serial numbered. So I'm leaving them a legacy when I'm gone. They can actually carry it when I'm gone. So it's a legacy. So I, I tell people really here again, reiterating the fact that young people need to attach themselves to something larger than themselves. They need to go through the tough times and they need to find unconditional love. But then at the final phase, they need to be inspirational to the next generation and do this interview like we did today.